Well, now to a breathtaking view of our land of Australia and the way we humans live within it. Usually people like me writing scripts add the word wide brown land or ancient continent or uh, cliches like this. But this book that I'm going to talk about now, Great Southern Land, does far more. It basically goes beyond the cliches and tries to examine the way Australians live these days within this ancient continent of ours. The aerial views, including those of veteran landscape photographer Richard Waldendorp, are enthralling, but it's also the choices made by the two men sitting with me now that mark this work out as something quite special, because they've chosen to be intensely curious about how modern Australians grapple with the impact of Mother Nature on this land. It is a tug of war, they say, but a war that can't be, nor should be won. This book is not, though, a lament about humans' footprints. That's what I like about it. I didn't read it so anyway. Just that this balancing act we must continue to play is truly an epic tale. And uh, I'll flesh out more with Ivan Omani and Steve Bibb. Ivan was series producer of the documentary series Great Southern Land, and Steve was executive producer. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Congratulations on just a beautiful book. But in a country this big, you say, it's only from the air that you can truly see what is at stake. So, Steve, in Mm. your words, what is at stake? It's it's interesting because it is that clarity that uh, you you can only get by being in the air. You know, you're stuck in the ground in the midst of it. You can't possibly see that. And we go about our daily lives and you can't possibly appreciate that. So you need to get above and to see that, that clarity. Um, what's at stake? And lots of things at stake. You know, we look at, um, you know, there's food security is a, is a big issue we look at. We look at um, power generation and how we're going to do that into the future. Uh, we look at all these sort of issues that are that are at stake, uh, population growth, how we maintain our population growth. And um, there are lots of debate around that. We don't get into it. It's not a polemic. The, t- the television series nor the book is a polemic. No. It is It is a count of how we are today. Uh, better or worse, it's how we are today. It celebrates the good things we've done and it sort of questions the things that may be we're not doing so well. Is it full of wonder and awe, Ivan O'Mahony? Would you use those sorts of words? I think it's it's really hard to um, not be in awe once you hover above Australia. But I don't think that the uh, that the series is is just celebratory in in that sense. I think there's a, there's plenty of grit in it, both in the book and in the TV show. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the examples from the show is this story that we did with Laurie Fellino with a bear hender whose job it is to climb on high wire, on um, on live uh, live wires, you know, brimming with a, a half a million volts. And he does that so that he can keep the insulators clean and keep keep the power on, and we can have our cups of tea uninterrupted. And so there's a lot of very gritty stories. There's Where a lot does of, he work? He works in Victoria, and there's a lot of stories like that as well, both in the book and in the series, that really show you know the work that people are doing throughout Australia to the kind of jobs that we're not really aware of. Laurie has identified a faulty spacer, a crucial device holding the lines apart. If they touch and short out. Thousands of homes will be without power. A more hands-on approach is needed. Feeling of freedom going along a power line, it's just an exciting part of my day. Sometimes I do stop and think why, but yeah, I know why I do it. Two kids at home that need to be fed Next time you flick on your AC, think of Laurie and his high wire act. That electricity network, Mm. um, which, you know, nobody thinks about that, do they, across this land? Mm. Uh, Did you before you started the series, Dan? No, not at all. And that's one of the things that was a joy about making the series and and researching the book and writing the book is that uh, you learn so much that perhaps we should have known, <laughs> about about the series. So, no, it's a, an enormous amount that we learned about it. And and the power grid and, and the fact that there are, you know, it's this massive power grid going from 
northern Queensland down to, to Victoria. Then there are these other grids running in WA and, and through the Territory. And, and the uh, wind that's arrived. You know, I just mm. saw an amazing map that came across our desk of, of the wind farms all yes. around Australia. Mm, yes. Incredible, to be candid. Now, did you see that? Could you actually see that from the air? Uh, absolutely. Well, one of the best scenes, one of my favourite scenes in in, uh, in the show, and it's in the book, is when we took our host, Steve, uh, Professor Steve Simpson, up. And uh, it was Ivan's idea, actually, which was to put him in a, a glider. So he was gliding across wind farms. And the idea being, of course, that the, the wind that's keeping him afloat and keeping up in the air was also powering these turbines and powering homes and, and, and so forth. And uh, I hadn't quite appreciated the... I guess the dimension of it and the scale of how much there is in terms of wind power out there now. And, and could you compare and contrast in a way, Ivan, with the coal mines? Because you do talk about mm, coal. And yes. one of the things you tell me, which I didn't know, was that HMS Endeavour yes, was right. actually a converted coal carrier. That's <laughs> right, yes. Right back for our very start as a settled nation, yeah. we had coal in our, and, and Bass and Flinders uh, were the first two early explorers to actually find coal. So when you were looking at these power stations from the air, what impact did it make on you? The one thing that really stands out when you watch it from the air is just how vast the coal industry is. And this is both looking at the mines and the power stations. You know, there are so many of them dotted everywhere around the landscape. But what is also, you know, what is really interesting is now more and more you're seeing these turbines come up. Of course, Australia is right in the path of the Roaring Forties. So that whole belt in Victoria and Tasmania is incredibly wind prone. And it's, in fact, is seen as one of the best places on earth to build these wind machines. So... Um, what about the dingo fence? I just heard Fran Kelly recently talking to a, um, a sheep farmer from, I think, near, around near Blackhall in Queensland who was getting out completely of sheep because he'd had to go out. The dingoes were coming down through the fence. They were savaging his sheep and alleged, he said that they eat their sheep that's alive. So it's a terrible death, in other words, for the sheep. And it, uh, he, I think it was an extraordinary drop-off in sheep farming, partly through cattle prices, but because of this problem of the dingoes coming down through the fence. Now, tell us what it was like to see that fence, Steve. Well, we, uh, what's amazing is I didn't realise, you asked me before, another thing I didn't know uh, was this, the scale of that fence and how vast and long it is and where it goes from and where it ends up. And, and of course, it goes across, you know, very varying countryside. So how you maintain the fence is quite a question, uh, you know, in such a vast area. So if you don't maintain it very quickly, those sort of incidents can happen. So it's an impressive looking fence, no doubt about it. But it's it strikes you, you know, that it's a big job just to just to maintain things, which is what we do in the, in the book and in the series is look at the people who are maintaining them. But we also filmed um, uh, and mentioned in the book, I think, uh, the idea of a, a trapper down in 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 um, New South Wales in the Snowy Mountains area, yeah. and how his job is actually once the, ding the dingoes who are down in that area, and also the um, uh, the sort of rabid uh, hybrid dogs down there, and how they're killing sheep down there as well and his job is to stop them so these are dogs obviously dingoes within the well past the fence they're actually within it as well but the devastation is enormous it's just inconceivable that mm. we build a dingo fence now isn't it just shows oh, yeah. you about attitudes yeah. to yeah. australia and people sort of saying we're going to tackle this land infrastructure and, and this type big of infrastructure yeah. <laughs> big infrastructure yes yeah, certainly the other interesting thing sorry geraldine with that fence is that the, the re because there's a fence it's also the reason we don't have camels in new south wales Hmm. because it's what's kept the camels at bay. So we've got a million camels roaming the outback, but they're not in New South Wales, and it's one of the few parts in Australia where they, they barely right. exist, and it's because of, because of the dingo fence. And in fact, uh, the people who maintain the dingo fence, the various organisations who do that throughout the states, whenever they know that a certain part of that fence is near camel territory, they'll heighten it and they'll electrify it. Mm. So you talk to the guys who maintain the fence every now and then, they'll find a camel on its back because it's just had a, a little bit of a hit. <laughs> and it's still and it's still wondering what happened to it. <laughs> <laughs> the drama of the Goldfields pipeline. Yeah. The mm. the C. Y. O'Connor, the great engineer who killed himself, rode into the sea on That's his right. horse and killed himself. Who knows exactly why, but he'd been subject to constant criticism mm. um, by people who said it can't mm. be done. That obviously, the longest freshwater pipeline in the world, obviously that totally captured your imagination. Oh, it did. It did because, you know, again, when you actually get to see this thing and you think, you know, they did this when? And I'm going, back then, okay, so how much, yeah, so how much you know, technology did they have then and how much do we have now? And they put this massive infrastructure project in. 
And they just did it because it had to be done. Talk about a big vision. Oh, a totally big vision. And the pressure on that, that poor fellow Siwa O'Connor was dreadful. You know, the criticism from the local papers, the local editor of the local paper was, was tremendous and, and the different governments at the time saying, you're wasting money, why would you ever put um, water out to, out to there? It'll never work. Kalgoorlie will never work. Coolgardie will never work. But it does more than nourish Kalgoorlie and a gold mine. It also gives life to farms, 100,000 people and 6 million sheep. A tug of war won with bold foresight. Building new pipes today would unlock more land, but moving water a long way is very costly and the overall benefits debatable. Look, overall, I've got to say, it was the, the pics of the true outback mm. that I just thought were unforgettable. I mean, they're all lovely pictures, but the outback, it, it, it just... <laughs> It must be, it's terribly hard on individuals on the ground, but my gosh, there's mm. nothing like it, I don't mm. think, anywhere else in the world, did mm. it? I mean, mm. Ivan, you're a good Dutch Irishman or Irish Dutchman, <laughs> Australian not quite sure. now. Australian recently. now. Um, did it strike you like that? The, or did it capture you or not? Or is it, it too big? It, it did. I think this is where the, uh, also the photographs of Richard Waldendorp have helped tremendously with the book. Um, you know, in the, in the television show, we were able to showcase some of it. But um, actually, the outback is a very difficult part of Australia to work, to get the right helicopters to put our, um, our Cineflex uh, cameras under. Because they only fit to certain helicopters. Those helicopters tend to be in the more build-up areas, whereas the mustering helicopters, the Robinsons that they use in the outback, are not the right type. So we, we tried to cover the outback as much as we could in the television series. But it's really in the book where it comes into its own because Richard was able to fly over with a little airplane and take all those extraordinary shots. Look, question for you both. Do we really know our land or not? Are we becoming more detached from it? That's a really good question and uh, I've been looking into that just recently actually. And I, I, think, I think to a large degree we don't. I don't think we know this land because there's a school of thought to say that the land is still trying to teach the humans how to behave in this country and that eventually the humans will learn and the land will say, okay, now we can get along. I think there's a real big school of thought about that now. So, you know, when, we, when we're flying, and I was lucky enough to do um, some of the filming, some of the directing, rather, um, and I actually got up in the air quite a bit uh, and saw that. And I, I thought, no, we probably don't. Um, it's, it's remarkable when you see the farms and what the farmers can do in a land with so little rain. So they know their land very well and they generally do a remarkable adapting, job. Judging by your they adapt amazingly and they're doing a remarkable job to feed to feed this country and, and to feed uh, a lot of people overseas as well. So they, they're adapting and they, their ingenuity is, is quite incredible. So that's terrific to see. We're collecting a, a signal from the sky that's going to a beacon on our tractor. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good. You put, take your shoes off, put your feet up on the glass, pour yourself a cup of coffee, talk on the phone. Yeah, it's all, it's all, all a bit easy. It's all good. The GPS system has been a very useful tool for us. This little green emblem here is the header in the paddock and it's following this white line. And uh, yeah, so here we are here and that's where we're heading. $20,000 buys you a revolution in farming. Have you changed your habits at all, Ivan, as a result? You're an urban yes. boy. <laughs> Uh, so that you get out more or you, you take your young children out more. It, does it affect you like that or is it too big? That's the interesting question, I suppose. I, I can answer that question because when I, I went out to Uluru, I was lucky enough to go and um, to direct a shoot we did uh, right next to Uluru, which was an amazing moment for me. So you, you fly out there, arrive, and, of course, there's the airport not far from, from the rock itself. So the first time I'd ever been there. You know, so in my 40-odd years, first time I'd been there. And, uh, and you get out there and then we went up in a helicopter and we were hovering at, I think, 5,000 feet watching, we were filming another aircraft going around, which is a flying metal detector. But we, before we started filming, we were just sitting there waiting for this plane to, you know, aircraft to come around. And I was just sitting there looking out the window and I just thought, I've got this sort of armchair view of Uluru and the countryside uh, right in front of me. And I thought, isn't that quite remarkable? And I thought, why haven't my kids seen it? Why hasn't why my wife seen it? So straight back, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to go out there. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. This is because what, it imminent? inspires you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because it inspires you to do these things, and and seeing even even flying over the floods of the Riverina, where there were vast areas where the um the uh, which were inundated, 
uh, and seeing that, and it was quite terrible for the farmers, but I, I was sitting there saying, you know what, it's actually quite beautiful countryside and we should be seeing more of these things and getting out there more. And we take a lot of this stuff for granted as city people, absolutely take it too much for granted. I'm an evangelist for us all getting out <laughs> there. I'm unabashed. Look, gentlemen, thanks indeed very much for, for this fabulous book and the series and just being so in, intrigued. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Ivan Omani and uh, Steve Bibb, thank you very much indeed for joining Saturday Extra. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.